Number 10. 3D Man. Okay, we're gonna start this one out on a trippy note. Meet Charles Chandler. He entered Marvel Comics back in 1977 in Marvel Premiere issue 35. He's an American test pilot who got his powers from radiation after an explosion while escaping scrolls. Now, Charlie was consumed by radiation and his brother Hal had to witness the entire thing. Super tragic. Now, the explosion imprinted an image of Charlie onto Hal's glasses. So now, if Hal focuses hard enough, he can project Charlie back into existence as this man, this 3D man. Now Hal would fall into a coma when this happens, and over time the brothers would swap on who's actually controlling the 3D man. Mind you, the 3D man is three times stronger than the average human being, but he's also three times as confusing because none of these powers should make sense in any way. And before we continue on with this trippy list, guys, if you can go ahead and give this video a thumbs up right at the bottom, that would be awesome. And if you haven't already subscribed, you're here, you're watching, click that while you're at it, and then we can be friends. You guys are the best, now let's get right back into the video. Number nine, Stone Boy. Dag Wentum is not from Earth, first of all. He's actually from the planet Zwen as a member of the Legion of the Substitute Heroes. He made his DC Comics debut with Adventure Comics issue 306. He comes out of the gate hot, he comes out confident, he calls himself Stone Boy because he can turn himself into solid stone. But the Legionnaire said my power was too static and would accomplish nothing positive. Watch me change. I mean, we didn't need the last 80% of that, but they're also not wrong. Your powers are amazing, but you can't really do much. He just turns to stone. The team uses him by dropping him as a stone on the head of their enemies. That's like when you're playing Smash Bros and your friend picks Kirby and all they do is just float above and then smash down on you. You're like, really? We just fight. I'm, I'm that person, I'm that friend. So this ability came because his home world would rotate so slowly that the nights are a half of a year long. So they evolved super suspended animation. Hypnotic suggestion is the reason he can wake up, but how does any of this even happen? It's not even explained. Does it hurt? Is it itchy? Oh, it must be so itchy. Number eight, Matter Eater Lad. Matter Eater Lad, okay, he comes from the planet Bismol, not like Pepto-Bismol, which you may think it should be after reading this, where microbes made their food inedible and the population soon had to evolve or starve. Now, they didn't turn into farmers, they didn't create new food, they did, however, gain the ability to eat any and all matter. So now we have Matter Eater Lad, aka Tenzel Chem. He was part of that same crew with Sun Boy and Stone Boy, you know, that fantastic Stone Boy we just talked about. The dude introduces himself to the team when he eats an old ray gun. He even says yum yum, like he likes the taste of an old ray gun. The team actually decides to use him. They're like, okay, well he could just literally eat our way to freedom. And then even in the thought bubble, it shows him like eating a jail cell. And they're like, yeah, he's not wrong. It's pretty, we could use him. And then Tenzel even says, I know what's on your mind. I'm unusual. I don't qualify. No, Tenzel, what's on our mind is where does that food go after you yum yum eat it? Like I'm no doctor, but an old ray gun, that's, that can't feel good coming out. He's like, hey guys, look how many thumbtacks I can eat. The whole team's like, no, Tenzel, wait, no, no. Number seven, Multiple Man. James Madrox. He made his first appearance in Giant Size Fantastic Four issue four. And his ability, you probably just know by his name. He can make duplicates. He wasn't used very much in the X-Men and he spent most of his days with X-Factor. Now his powers may seem weak compared to gods and wizards, but this guy makes me ask a lot of questions because at one point James had 40 of him. There are 40 James running around town. That's a lot of James. So the duplicates feel, think, and act independently, but they're guided by the original James. So each of these duplicates manifests one aspect of James' personality. And the longer that they're away from the OG James, the more those traits become extreme. And if one of these duplicates passed away, he can sense the general area where the body is. But there's a logic question to be asked here. Like for example, if he eats a handful of diamonds and then multiplies into 40 James, and then all those James did the mama bird method and you know, puked up those diamonds, do they all have the same contents inside their stomach? Do we just make more diamonds? If so, we may have figured out a really gross solution to a lot of problems. Number six, Swarm. Okay, meet Fritz von Meyer. He made his debut in Champions issue 14 back in 1977. And as you could probably guess by his name, he's a swarm of bees. How terrifying is that? He's made of a thousand bees. This goes back to that one day where he was still just a German beekeeper and he found a beehive that was unlike any other hive he had seen. So he made a device that he hoped would reawaken these bees. And originally he thought that these bees were an end result of a mutation with a nearby fallen meteorite. So he was pumped about it. These were unique bees after all, because when he tried to capture the queen bee, the others just devoured him. They ate him. There were only bones left over. But now these bees were so special because now his consciousness was spread out throughout all 
all of these thousands of bees, and now you have the scariest villain ever. Just a man made of bees. Here, take my wallet, take my phone, whatever you want. Yeah, you're, you're made of bees. I'm not gonna fight you. No way I'm throwing hands with a thousand bees. Get out of town. Also, that must be extremely hard to do. I mean, he makes himself look like the shape of a human. That's extreme coordination. Number five, chaos magic. First of all, what really even is chaos magic? What, who came up with this name? Also, these are no longer mutant powers that belong to Scarlet Witch. They allow her to alter reality and do all kinds of wacky stuff. Cause magic and cause comics. Magic is always a weird one to talk about because it never really needs to be as strongly defined as others. It's magic after all. So in a sense, almost anything can be possible. You can just be like, well, it's magic. So whatever. The most bizarre things about these powers and Scarlet Witch's character in general are the inconsistencies. In the MCU, her powers are nowhere near as powerful as in the comics. And her power levels, even in the comics, fluctuate all the time. Another inconsistency has been their origin, which has created some pretty big plot holes. Like, okay, so how did Hope use Scarlet Witch's power, or amplify Scarlet Witch's power, if you will, to help rid the world of the Phoenix Force if Scarlet Witch was never a mutant? Hope can only take mutant powers. Hope can only amplify mutant powers. So that doesn't make any sense anymore. Number four, bad luck versus good luck and probability. It's strange that comics even felt it necessary to grant Black Cat superpowers at all, but of course, as her name implies, she ended up getting bad luck powers added to her character, which caused those around her to experience bad luck. The weird thing is that shouldn't this then mean that because Black Cat's enemies have bad luck, she herself therefore has good luck? And therefore that good luck should maybe help to eliminate the negative effects of the bad luck powers for the people that she cares for. But no, apparently your enemies having bad luck does not necessarily mean that you get good luck for you and your friends. You get good luck, no one else does. To be honest, the whole idea of probability as a power is confusing to me and makes my head hurt just thinking about how much the world around you would actually have to be manipulated to make that superpower actually work. Although I will say, I do think luck is an awesome power to have, regardless of how illogical it seems to me at times. I just keep wondering when the mysterious stranger from Fallout is going to pop up and give Domino a hand in the comics. I always put a lot of luck into my characters when I'm playing on Fallout 4. When I create my characters, I put a lot into luck. I just think it's, luck can be great. Also, do Black Cat and Domino's powers cancel each other out if they fight each other? Has this happened in the comics? Someone let me know. And if it hasn't happened, we need to make it happen with hero clicks. Number three. Phasing. Okay, so this one is less about the power being ridiculous, contradictory, or inconsistent because of writing. In other words, this non-understandable power is not really a why moment, but a how moment. Okay, well, it's, it's kind of a why and a how, but it's coming from a place of mystery and actually really good writing, as opposed to some of the other powers mentioned on this list, which are kind of random. Captain Kate Pride, as we know her now, or Kitty Pride, or Shadow Cat, as we once knew her, has been struggling with her phasing powers lately in the comics. Now, I don't want to spoil anything for those of you who aren't caught up yet on the Marauders comics, so we're going to only talk about a mystery that is revealed in issue one, talk about some stuff that happens sort of later, but I won't give anything away. And this mystery plot point that we're talking about is that Kate cannot enter Krakoa. Not just that she cannot use her powers, not just that, she, she can't even use her powers to phase through a gate or any other organic Krakoan matter. The answer as to why hasn't been revealed yet, but many speculate this unexplainable power restriction could actually have to do with Kate not really being a mutant. Now, what do you think? Are Kate's powers possibly not mutant in origin anymore? Also, if you want, one of the other things I'm talking about happens in Marauders issue number six, and I would encourage you to check out that issue of Marauders if you're into this whole mystery thing. Also, just read all of Marauders. It's really good. You should read it. If you like Kitty Pride, if you like Storm, Sorry, Kate Pride, Kate Pride. Number two, Invisible Jet. So while it's actually a piece of equipment, not really an inherent superpower, Wonder Woman has a lot of extra items that are iconic for granting her additional abilities or additional powers, like her bracelets and her lasso. Her Invisible Jet is also one of those items. Of course, an invisible plane sounds 
like an amazing thing to have. It allows you to fly and grants you the ability to sneak up on your enemies, except that it really isn't as stealthy as you'd think, as the pilot of the jet can actually be seen through the invisible exterior of the ship, meaning that on a clear day, you'd be able to see Wonder Woman approaching you from miles away, just flying towards you in like a seated position. So not really initially as cool as it sounds, I think. Number one, mostly invulnerable. Despite Kar zor being a sometimes Kryptonian, of course, depending on the storyline that you're reading, we won't go into all the convoluted origins that Power Girl has had. So with Power Girl from Earth 2 being more often than not associated with Kryptonian physiology, as opposed to Atlantean, which grants her super strength when powered by a yellow sun, you would expect that she would be super durable as well. After all, super strength without durability, it doesn't make much sense as performing feats of strength could leave you crippled. And you know, Superman's also super durable. And of course, she is invulnerable. However, there was a time when all it took to beat Kara was sticks and stones. That's right, she was invulnerable except for unprocessed materials, which doesn't really make any sense. No matter her heritage in the storyline, any way you slice it, it's pretty weird stipulation to put on that power. You're telling me that if I fire a bunch of big guns and torpedoes at her, it'll do nothing. But if I throw like a rock at her head, she's done for? What the heck? Of course, Power Girl is also one of those characters who's really just had a rough go when it comes to weird changes to her character like this one. Thank you so much for watching Nerd Squad. What are some of the hottest and most illogically powered female superheroes that you can think of? Who do you think are some of the hottest and most illogically powered female superheroes? What are some of the most illogical powers that you can think of for our sexy, sexy superhero ladies? Number 10, Chamber. Chamber is a weird character, but also a beloved character. Like many weirdos that I love to talk about, Chamber is also a mutant. His name is Jonathan Starsmore, and while he may actually have the potential to be considered Omega level, that doesn't make his powers any less weird. His powers relate to the fact that he is actually made out of pure psionic energy, or at least he was once his mutant powers manifested. When his powers first manifested, as a result, they blew a massive hole in his chest and his face, basically blowing off his jaw. While many people would be immensely harmed or even killed by such an occurrence, Chamber was not. Jono, as a result, no longer needed to breathe, eat, or drink, and his blood even even did not need to course through his veins to keep him alive. As such, he is typically seen with a scarf or some other piece of clothing covering the lower half of his face, because you know, it's not there anymore, and he communicates telepathically as his jaw was blown off when his powers first emerged. So you know, kinda hard to talk without a jaw. Number nine, Flatman. Flatman, or Matt to his friends, is a mutant with the power of being flat and being able to stretch his limbs. He got his start working as a Mr. Fantastic impersonator at parties before eventually deciding to go into the hero business himself, joining the Great Lakes Avengers, assuming the false identity of Dr. Val Ventura. In addition to his stretching powers, Flatman can also make himself nearly invisible by turning to the side. Now, Mr. Fantastic's powers barely make any sense and are weird, but Flatman takes this to a whole new level. Unlike Mr. Fantastic, he must remain two-dimensional when using his powers, which brings up a lot of questions about the, the placement of his internal organs. But he is well-versed in a made-up fighting style he calls origami foo. So make of that what you will. Number eight, Beak. Beak is interesting in the sense that he has a physical mutation as a mutant, but one that is seemingly kinda useless. His mutation granted him wings and a beak, a bird-like appearance overall, but really these things are only an appearance alone. Beak does eventually manage to fly in the comics, but only after a long time trying to figure it out. And even then, he struggles really hard to do so, and can only fly for short distances at best. So he's no angel if you know what I mean. Beak's real strength lies in his ability to be so likable. He makes friends easily and is usually more useful in that regard. What's even stranger though is you would think this might be challenging for someone like Beak who, you know, looks pretty abnormal. However, this seems to have the opposite effect from what you'd expect and instead of alienating people, Beak finds it all too easy to draw people near, relate to them, and make fast friends. But hey, he's a pretty nice guy, so I suppose when you really think about it, kind of does make sense. Number seven, forget me not. Not to be confused with the other Marvel character with the same superhero name who controls pheromones to make men fall in love with her, Poison Ivy style, Zab 
Abby has what could allegedly be called the power to be immediately forgotten by anyone he meets as soon as he leaves their field of vision. He was a member of the X-Men, although none of his teammates were aware of this most of the time. In fact, Professor X had to set up a psychic reminder to remind him once every hour that Forget-Me-Not existed. He had his uses and was especially good at reconnaissance missions, but once Xavier died, he became depressed and left the team. They didn't notice. Despite the fact that he gave the eulogy. In the years since, he has taken up work on the mutant island nation of Krakoa as a detective, partnered with the Juggernaut. They make a good team, considering that Juggernaut never remembers that he has a partner. Number 6. Zeitgeist Zeitgeist was known for his weird power, which, when it first manifested, actually scarred the face of a young woman he happened to be making out with at the time. His power is that he is acidic vomit, which I'm not really sure how you could best utilize that, and it would definitely make for quite the hazard if you had the flu and you know, you're feeling really nauseous. He wears a protective mouthpiece to help prevent any other dangerous cases from happening. Zeitgeist acid vomit is powerful enough that it can actually burn through solid steel. But other than that, he is just somewhat more durable than your normal mortal human, which I guess makes sense. If you are someone who can vomit acid, you have to be fairly durable to even be able to do that and live. Axel Clooney is a mutant and used to be the leader of the X-Force at one point but currently leads the rival team to Ecstatics, known as The Excellent. Which also, if you aren't reading The Excellent, you should check it out. Number 5. Tag Okay, I actually kind of wish I had Brian Cruz's power. It just seems like the perfect chaos creating ability. Tag's ability, known as the Pariah Effect, allows him to use a form of telepathy when he touches someone that causes the target to emit a psionic signal which would make them a target for others to run away from or to run towards. Whichever way people would run, they would do it while being fully aware of what they're doing but unable to control themselves. If they were being controlled to run away, they would continue to do so until they were about 100 feet away. But if the signal caused them to run towards whoever it is, then they would dogpile on top of the target. What's strange is that he could also control who was affected by the ability, like how? He only made one person it, so how does he decide who runs away and who doesn't? He could also make whoever was it run away from themselves. So in other words, they would just run uncontrollably and in random directions, which is actually kind of hilarious. He also would always say, you're it, which is kind of misleading because that person can't tag someone else to make them it. Which is kind of unfair as well. So. Number 4. Dupe Ranking a little lower for me because he's not necessarily a mutant, maybe, is Dupe. Dupe is a creature who often is lumped in with the mutants, but maybe isn't one? We don't really know what Dupe is, never mind his power set. Dupe is basically an unstoppable force and has been implied to be a mutant, an alien, a mutant alien, or something else entirely. As of right now, his origin is classified on his own wiki with him being an artificial being, which really doesn't help to clarify anything. If he is a mutant, and I'm not saying conclusively that he is or that he isn't, as I still feel like his origin in general can be really contested at this point, his power is really are hard to classify. It's kind of like he's an old school superhero in the sense that he seems to have powers for whatever task he needs to accomplish at the time, including resurrection, the power of funk, love eyes, breaking the fourth wall, moving between panels, and even magic. Dupe has been spotted seemingly fighting alongside the mutants as recently as the AXE Judgment Day event, implying that he is at least allied with Krakoa. For those of you that don't think he's a mutant, I still to kind of think he might be. Who knows? Number 3. Hijack The mutant known as David Bond has the oddly specific ability to control vehicular mechanisms with his thoughts. Basically, this is a form of technopathy, and he has been able to control automobiles and shield helicarriers, starting their engines, steering them, and even opening their doors. He has also been shown to be able to control high-tech suits of armor. Now, uh, this kind of leads me to have more questions than anything else. Like, can he control motorcycles? What about bicycles? Rollerblades? Does the vehicle need to have an internal computer? What's the deal with opening and closing car doors? Does that not count as a form of telepathy? Why can he control high-tech suits of armor? What if a car has mechanical issues? Can he tell? Does the vehicle need to be in complete functioning order? Does it need to be able to turn on? I have so many questions and like no answers. Number 2. I Scream I Scream. Oh boy, what a wonderful weirdo this is. You know how much I have a strange affinity for mutants who have eye-based mutations and visual power sets if you're 
you know, usually on this channel. And if you are usually on this channel, you should subscribe if you aren't already. But despite the I in Ice Cream's name, he is not one of those. Instead, his mutant power seems to be that he can turn himself into ice cream. Get it? I scream. Ice cream. He's only appeared once, I believe, in the comics, making a singular appearance in a strange comic in and of itself from Marvel, Obnoxio the Clown, issue number one. In this weird single issue, Obnoxio is a clown and he's employed to act as entertainment for a surprise birthday party at the X Mansion that is being hosted for young X member Kitty Pride. While this is going on, Ice Cream, a villain, also appears and sneaks into the mansion, hoping to coordinate a stealthy attack on the X Men. Instead, he ends up attempting to get Obnoxio out of the way, which he kind of succeeds in, only to later be captured in a block of ice, because he can turn into ice cream. What I want to know is what was Ice Cream's plan of attack with his power set? Is anyone on the main team featured here lactose intolerant? Was that his plan? I have to know. Number one, El Guapo. Tell me that someone, thanks to genetic mutation, can fold space or speak binary code or always win, and I'll look at you sideways, but I'll nod and walk away. But you tell me that some guy named Robbie Rodriguez, thanks to a genetic mutation, has no actual powers of his own, but instead has a symbiotic relationship with a super powered flying skateboard which followed his mental commands and sometimes even seemed to have a personality of its own or or acted on his subconscious thoughts. I'm sorry, I'm out. I'm done. Where did the skateboard come from? How did he discover this ability? When did this mutant power activate? Can he do this to other skateboards or inanimate objects in general? You can't just give someone the most unique and insane mutant ability and explain none of it. Coming in at number 10 is Iska the Unbeaten. This spot could as easily been taken by Domino as Iska Iska also has a form of limited tychokinesis, which is probability manipulation, or also known as the power of luck, which is probably one of the most unexplainable powers because we can't even say that luck is for sure a real thing. But Iska takes it one step further into ridiculousness with the power of being literally unable to lose. Iska has the power to always win, no matter what, whether that is individual one on one contests, votes, or wagers, or larger battles where she is a member of a group. In contests of skill, her powers might give her the talent she needs to win, or she might just win through quote, improbable circumstances. In larger battles or wars, her powers detect the probability of both sides winning and have literally led her to defect from the losing side and join the winning side, meaning she still personally wins. It's not that we don't understand it, it's that it can't even properly be explained without sounding utterly ridiculous. Love Iska the Unbeaten though, great character. Number nine, Rainbow Girl. She is the first superpowered individual on this list affiliated with the Legion of Superheroes, but she definitely definitely won't be the last. The team seems to be just a sticky flytrap for all the random and wacky superheroes out there in the universe. Unlike some others though, Rainbow Girl didn't actually make it onto that team as her powers were deemed not useful enough. Instead, she made it onto the Legion of Substitute Heroes, which I'm assuming is the Legion that villains either don't listen to or the Legion that just puts on a movie for villains to watch instead of just teaching them. I mean, fighting them. Anyways, why is Rainbow Girl useless? Well, she can harness the emotional spectrum. Red for rage, orange for green, yellow for fear, green for will, blue for hope, indigo for compassion, and violet for love. But unlike the lanterns, she has no ring to use the power through, and she cycles through the colors impulsively, meaning it leads to terrible mood swings. Number eight, Legion. David Haller was living in Paris with his mother when her home was invaded by a assassination team. They took out David's stepfather before his eyes, which kicked off his latent psionic powers, which he used to incinerate the brains out of the assassins. However, as he did so, he made telepathic contact with each of his victims, thus experiencing their thoughts and emotions as they died, which, as you can imagine, deeply affected David, forcing him into a catatonic state. The consciousness of the leader of the assassins, Jamail Karami, was absorbed and merged into David's mind. The terrible trauma that David had suffered had splintered David's personality into multiple altars, with each of these altars controlling a different psionic power. Because of this, Legion is an omega level mutant able to create spontaneous mutations of different kinds that are accompanied by new personas or alter egos to govern each one of these new mutations. Now, David himself stated that he had in his mind 200 omega level split personalities, but the X-Men Rogue stated that while she was in 
side legion, she was connected to thousands of types of powers and there were more, quote, being born all the time. How this works, I have absolutely no idea, but it does and he is skewy. Number 7. Matter Eater Lad Honestly, Tenzel Kem's power, one shared by his whole race, gives me more questions than it gives me answers. Matter Eater Lad's main shtick is that he can eat any substance of matter in any form, solid, liquid, or gas, in any amount at super speed. Bismolians, which are his race, come from a planet where over time microbes made regular food inedible. In turn, their species evolved to be able to eat any form of matter thanks to producing a variety of digestive enzymes that act on specific specific substances, making them easier to chew and digest. Bismolians can also metabolize food almost instantly, and if they gotta, they can consume tons of food in minutes. So where I am left confused is exactly where all that stuff goes. Not to get like too into it here, but what's Tenzel's bathroom situation like? Also dental. I'm assuming their teeth are of a denser material than human teeth. One Bismolian who was part of the Yellow Lanterns ate people, which caused him to get his teeth removed as punishment. But he then had those replaced with Bismolian steel, allowing him to bite through almost anything. So my question is, could he not bite through anything before? Also, if Tenzel eats a whole asteroid, which he has done before, where does he poop? I just have so many questions and like, no answers. I would just one, just one answer. Number six, The Flash. Wally West is easily the fastest of all the speedsters out there. He has an almost spiritual connection to the speed force that allows him to do a great number of things, from traveling time to creating electrical energy constructs. Thanks to a heart condition, Wally has even been able to freeze time, which basically allows him to move at super speed without actually moving at super speed. And if you can explain exactly how that works, to me, I will give you one single dollar. That's all I got. The speed force is basically time, the representation of reality in motion being the very cosmic force that pushes space and time forward. So how is it that people can hold chunks of it or create lightning constructs with it or absorb speed and momentum from other people or things? As a concept for time and a cosmic force, it is really hard to both wrap your head around it and explain the speed force and all the things that speedsters like Wally West and Barry Allen are able to do with it. You kind of just have to accept that this is what it is. Number five, Spider-Man. Spider-Man is one of the greatest superheroes of all time, but there has always been one thing about his powers that has confused fans over the years, his spider sense. To this day, people consider it to be one of his most inconsistent abilities, mostly because different writers have different ideas of how it works. Sometimes they can let him know exactly where danger is. Other times he has no idea why it's going off or knows why, but doesn't know where the danger is coming from. I mean, he has been able to dodge bullets or dodge attacks from behind, yet other times someone will just sneak up on him and he has no idea. Even in the films, it's been a source of debate, but this really all comes down to whoever is writing him. They just have different approaches to this specific ability. Number four, Scarlet Witch. Wanda is one of the most powerful heroes in both the comics and the MCU. In the comics, she uses a form of chaos magic in which she can warp reality. But in the films, her powers came from an infinity stone. In both versions, we still don't know exactly how her powers work. We know she uses magic, but the full extent of her powers is never really fully explained. She can wipe out almost the entire mutant population in the comics or almost kill Thanos in the films. Reality warping is a near limitless power, so technically with us only knowing that, she could essentially do anything. Scarlet Witch is such an amazing character in both the comics and films, so hopefully one day we learn a little bit more about her overall abilities. Number three, Daredevil. Matt Murdock, the lawyer from Hell's Kitchen, and Part of a show that was cancelled way too soon. <sighs> so, Daredevil actually has a similar problem to Spider-Man. His abilities have always been a bit inconsistent, specifically his radar sense. So, when Matt lost his sight, his other senses were all enhanced, to the point where he could technically see because his other senses were supercharged, they would create a picture of the world around him. But over the course of his superhero history, it has become a very inconsistent ability. Sometimes it can show him everything, other times not so much. Even in the TV show, which is amazing, it kind of changed from season to season, depending on the scenario. Although it did feel like they had a better grasp on it in the end, but unfortunately we will never see how that would have continued. Number two, Superman. Superman has a lot of powers. Some of them are very straightforward, while others are really not. For example, in the Superman film series, he was able to wipe away some of Lois's memories with a kiss, which people, you know, call the amnesia kiss. 
Also, in Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, he was fighting Nuclear Man, and when Nuclear Man ends up destroying some of the Great Wall of China. Also, in Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, he was fighting Nuclear Man, and Nuclear Man destroys some of the Great Wall of China. So, Superman is able to repair it with his eyes. And I am not joking. Outside of his heat vision, he has repair broken structures vision. Like, where was this in all the other films? He just learned it now? Like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And that's not all. In the Silver Age Superman comics, Superman was able to create a miniature clone of himself that he shot out of his own hand. And this clone possessed all of his powers. Like, what? It doesn't really make any sense. And they ended up scrapping the idea later on because it never shows up again. Thank goodness. Number one, the Sentry. Ah, uh, the Sentry. People call him Marvel Superman, but that really couldn't be farther from the truth. Aside from the S on his costume, they are nothing alike. Robert Reynolds is a complex character. He is not fully on one side. He has been a hero and a villain. His powers are limitless. He has super strength, super speed, invulnerability, regeneration, invisibility, matter manipulation, shape shifting, telekinesis, telepathy, healing, and the list goes on and on. Nothing could kill him. I mean, he's even flown into the sun and he was just okay. He fought the Hulk and won. The dude is so powerful that even the smartest people in the Marvel Universe haven't found a way to actually kill him for good. Number 10, Godlike Abilities. Donna Troy's Wonder Girl has had so many retcons to her backstory, it's really hard to keep track. But for the sake of this point, I would like to focus on the specific one where she was an orphan, saved, and raised on New Cronus before having her mind wiped and being returned to Earth as a young teen. Donna realized she had superhuman abilities and decided to join join up with another team, the Teen Titans. In fact, the name came from a memory that Donna had from her life before she was returned to Earth. You see, while Donna didn't know it, she was actually one of the Titan seeds, chosen by the goddess Rhea. What is really strange about her powers in this one is that there weren't more questions or concerns surrounding where they came from at the time. Of course, now we know what was up with that storyline, but also the origins of her powers have flip-flopped so many times, you might have even forgot this one yourself. I also just think it makes a lot more sense when her powers actually come from magic. Or like, she was also made out of clay. It just, like, then makes a lot more sense. Just a random orphan. Number 9. Power Cloning. Or mimicking? Power mimicking? Power copying? Hope Summers possesses the ability to adopt any other mutant's powers within a certain distance to her. She clones or mimics their powers and has access to those abilities when they are at their strongest. Pretty cool, right? But it gets even cooler. As far as we know, there is no real limit to how many powers Hope can take on at once. And even better, her powers don't work the same as Rogue's powers, in the sense that other mutants she takes powers from won't find their powers drained. And she does not have to make physical contact with them in order to mimic their powers. One of her few weaknesses, because I mean they had to give her something or she'd be way too powerful to make her even writable, are time and distance. But what I've wondered is what does this mean when Hope takes on the powers of a teleporter? Let's say she took on Nightcrawler's powers and she decided to travel to the moon. Could she do that? Would she make it all the way? Would her powers just conk out as soon as she got to, for example, the brimstone dimension? How do these powers even work when she moves to another dimension? Is that far enough for them to stop working or is that within range? There are a lot of unanswered questions. Would she even make it to the moon? Would she like get halfway there and then just like plop out of the air or something? All of these questions make me wonder exactly how the distance weakness applies exactly and what it means for Hope's insane mutant powers. Number eight, acid spit. Wait, what? Who is acid spit and is a super attractive female superhero? Why, Supergirl, of course. If you're not familiar with the storyline involving this, this one might throw you for a loop. After all, other Kryptonians like Superman can't spit acid, so what is up with this? Well, this power comes from a time when Supergirl was a Red Lantern, and it was through her power ring that she was granted this ability. So while you might not have understood this one before, hopefully that helps to explain it. Although, Supergirl as a Red Lantern to me is also a very strange idea, but it happened. Number seven, Canary Cry. Black Canary's Canary Cry is a confusing one because we've had so many different iterations of the character. Her Canary Cry has been a terrifying shriek that has been shown to destroy a building and possibly give someone brain damage. But then as an alternative, it's also been shown as just like a simple distraction power. The power level fluctuates almost as much as the origins of the Black Canary character has. So how powerful is the Canary Cry? 
Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Is it super powerful? Is it only a little powerful? Where are we on the power levels there? Number six, trichokinesis. Medusa of the Inhumans possesses the power to control her hair with a psychic field. She controls each strand using her hair to bind, attack, or even lift. The strange thing? Her hair has been shown to be even stronger than she is herself. All I can think to really make sense of how ridiculous this seems is that she must have a very good hair care routine for her hair to be as strong as it is. It has always made me wonder as well if like it hurts if she breaks a strand of hair or if it hurts to grow it because I imagine it's got to be thick. It's got to be heavy too. Medusa has a lot of hair. How does she lift all that hair? How does her neck survive? Number five, Video Man. Video Man first appeared in Spider-Man Family featuring Amazing Friends number one. He is a giant two-dimensional 8-bit creature that only yells video game phrases like destroy all combatants. He can shoot energy blasts from his arms that can blow up whatever they hit, which I can get on board with. But what makes him so confusing is that we're given zero context or explanation as to who or what he is or where he comes from. He just shows up and attacks Spider-Man and Iceman. At first I thought maybe he'd actually escape from an arcade game, but once he's destroyed the heroes discover an internal internal processor unit, which implies that he was created by someone and designed for the purpose of destruction. But who created him? More importantly, how did they create him? Will we ever find out in another appearance? No, because he never showed up again. Number four, Hammerhead. Former mob hitman who was critically injured on a job gone wrong. Hammerhead was taken into surgery and given a steel alloy plate, which gave his head its distinctive odd appearance. Although this barely qualifies as a power, he is known to attack his enemies by literally charging head first into them. He regularly smashes his head into walls and takes blows to the head from Spider-Man, seemingly brushing them off due to the metal plate on his head. This makes no sense if you know anything about how concussions work. In extremely basic terms, a concussion is caused when your head gets hit and your brain bangs against the inside of your skull, thus damaging your brain. So. Even if the steel plate prevents Hammerhead's skull from breaking, the sudden shock of smashing into a wall or taking a punch from a superhero with the proportionate strength of a spider would still cause him severe brain damage. It's why football players get concussions despite wearing helmets. Even once Hammerhead's brain was transferred into an adamantium skeleton by Mr. Negative, this same weakness would remain, as unlike vibranium, adamantium does not absorb the force of a blow. Number three, Ruby Thursday. For some reason, Thursday Rubenstein thought it would be a good idea to replace her head with a red orb that can reshape itself into dangerous tentacles and spikes. She used the abilities to fight the Defenders as a member of the head-themed supervillain group known as the Headman. Other abilities of the big red candy apple she calls a head are the ability to fire energy blasts and explode and reform. When concentrating really hard, she can also make the head take the form of a normal red-headed woman. Now, clearly nothing about Ruby Thursday makes sense, but this is the thing that really makes me scratch my head. Why is it harder for her to make the orb look like a head than it is for her to make it explode and reform. Come to think of it, why didn't she just make the head look normal to begin with? Number two, Bizarro. A Superman villain with several different origins, sometimes being a clone, sometimes being from an alternate dimension, and sometimes being a duplicate created by the Joker when he had the ability to alter reality. Bizarro's deal is that he's the opposite of Superman in every way, including his speech. For example, if he was hungry, he would express this by saying something like, Bizarro and I'm full and no want pizza. He has superpowers, but in true bizarro fashion, they manifest themselves as backwards versions of Superman's. So instead of heat vision in Arctic breath, Bizarro shoots ice beams out of his eyes and blows fire. What makes Bizarro's powers so confusing is the inconsistency that comes with them. His whole gimmick is supposed to be that he has the opposite powers of Superman. Yet, unlike Superman, he still has super strength and speed. You might think that I'm reading too much into this, but in All-Star Superman number 8, when Superman visits the Bizarro world, he sees a Bizarro version of the Flash who boasts that he has a top speed of 2 inches per hour. So, by this logic, Bizarro should be weak and unable to fly, yet he still manages to consistently hold his own in fights with Superman. As Bizarro would put it, that makes perfect sense. 
Number one, kangaroo. When he was a child, Frank Oliver was obsessed with kangaroos. He would study them from a distance and even spent time living among them so that he could learn to mimic their abilities. When he grew up, he became a criminal who used his jumping abilities to commit robberies and then leap away like a kangaroo. Although he was later given augmentations that heightened his abilities, in his first appearance in Amazing Spider-Man number 81, he's just a normal human who can jump like a kangaroo. That's a bit far-fetched, even for a comic book. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he studied kangaroos so well that he learned to jump just as well as them. It still doesn't add up. Let's crunch some numbers. A kangaroo can leap a distance of about 25 feet, which is undeniably impressive. Now, the long jump world record is around 29 feet, so it is conceivable that a human could accomplish that. However, the maximum height a kangaroo can jump is 6 feet, yet in his first appearance, we see Frank consistently and easily leaping at least 15 feet high. For reference, the current high jump world record is just over 8 feet. That would be impossible for a kangaroo, let alone some regular Australian dude. Number 10, Laktuka the Knower. Laktuka is a strange new character who I kinda love. Their powers are very interesting and unique. Laktuka in essence knows the location of everything and anything. Being considered as an omega level mutant as so many are in Araco who sit on the great ring, Laktuka resembles a night sky, looking like a sheet covered in stars with fabric that's made up from the cosmos. So cool. Laktuka's powers also might not seem so great in the sense that, you know, spatial awareness while useful isn't exactly considered powerful even when it's on a cosmic and universal scale, possibly even multiversal. Although the amount of times I've put down my phone and not known where it is, when it's even in my hand, I feel like having someone like you, you could just be like, yo, where's my phone? And they could be like, no, oh, it's right there. That would be pretty useful. However, when combined with the powers of a teleporter, while still strange, Latuka's powers could be seen as exceptionally great because then you can just like teleport anywhere. It's crazy. Number nine, Cypher. Cypher has what some people believe to be a pretty horrible mutant ability, especially when it comes to combat. Personally, I would kill to be able to subconsciously translate any written or spoken language, human or alien. He can also subconsciously understand body language and intention as well as decipher codes and computer languages. After he was resurrected, and also so Marvel could make him actually useful, everything he sees is interpreted into language, basically making him able to read life. Everything I just said is strange enough, but I can wrap my head around it to some degree, I guess. But don't you dare sit here and tell me that this man can speak binary code. In New Mutants Volume 3, number 14, a guy operating a mech comes upon Cypher during a battle, and Dougie Boy speaks to the mech saying, Hello, you don't have to do this. You know, I can set you free, show you how to think for yourself. The dude operating the mech understands him, since he's speaking English, but for some reason, the mech, which isn't artificial intelligence, also understands him, boots the operator out, and begins talking in zeros and ones. What? Number 8, Manifold. If you thought Laktuka was an interesting character, wait till you hear about Manifold. Although, with Laktuka being newer, you may already know of Manifold, because Manifold's been around for a while. But do you know how exactly his powers work? That is what is so cool, but can also be kind of confusing. Manifold is seen as a massively powerful teleporter, but the interesting thing is he actually isn't. I mean, he is really powerful, but he's not technically a teleporter. Instead, Eden and Fessy's mutant powers are based in communication, specifically communication with space. He is considered a universal shaper who can basically communicate with the universe over 616 and ask it to bend and fold for him, which is how he appears to teleport himself and others such great distances. But really, it's just talking. Number 7, Thumbelina. Christina Anderson has an ability that quite a few characters in comic books have. That would be the ability to shrink. Thumbelina can reduce herself down to about a quarter of an inch tall. That ability is perfectly fine in my eyes. Like I said, lots of characters can do this. My problem with Thumbelina, and also some other shrinkers, is how the heck do they retain their full size strength when they get smaller? Or in Thumbelina's case, how the hell does she get stronger when she shrinks? I'm sorry to try and bring physics into any debate about superheroes and their various powers, but it makes absolutely no sense in the laws of physics that someone who is smaller can be more strong than they were when they were regular size. Ants, for example, if they were the size of a person, they would be insanely strong as they are able to carry 20 times their body weight. So that's like an average person being able to carry like a small SUV or something. But since ants are so damn small, that means they can carry like a leaf 
or something. Thumbelina should not be able to knock someone out when she is a quarter of an inch tall. I'm sorry. That's all I gotta say. Number six, Iska the Unbeaten. Iska's powers are really cool, don't get me wrong, but how does it work exactly? I feel like we still have a lot of exploring to do with this character before we can really firmly answer that question. I've been reading Iska since she came into the comics and I'm still confused. Iska made her first appearance during the 2020 X-Men series, appearing in a tie-in issue to the X-Men crossover event Ten of Swords, which I still personally hold a great fondness for. As such, I also hold a fondness for this character, the sister-in-law to Apocalypse through his mutant wife Genesis. Iska is a mutant of the long lost mutant island of Arako, and her powers allow her to always win, but sometimes they also force her to always win, like against her will, and then other times, betting against her even can affect the result of a contest, even if she herself isn't involved in that. How does that work? Her powers also do not just extend to physical fights, but all means of competition. So like, if you're, I don't know, doing a coin toss with Iska, she gotta win. Number five, gold balls. Can you guess what gold balls is able to shoot out of his body? If you guessed gold balls, congratulations! Fabio Medina discovered this really odd mutant power while falling victim to a robbery in San Diego. Armed with his gold balls and his signature catchphrase, gold balls, Fabio took the world by storm as the newest member of the X-Men. Now, his powers don't make sense when you think about them too hard. Where are these balls coming from? How are they being formed so quickly? You know, the kind of weird stuff that applies to a lot of superheroes. But what sends Fabio into the realm of the bizarre is the fact that it was eventually discovered that the gold balls were actually infertile eggs that he was producing and shooting at people. In light of this news, Fabio retired the name Gold Balls and started calling himself Egg. Number four, Stone Boy. I think it says it all when you belong to a team with the words substitute heroes in the title. Dig Wentum is known as Stone Boy, and he belongs to the team known as the Legion of Substitute Heroes. He is an alien from the planet Zwen who can transform into a stone form, becoming super strong and super durable, but also immediately it makes him unable to move, rendering him completely immobile. Yeah, so not super useful in combat if you want to like actually do anything or beat someone, but pretty useful I guess if you just want to survive? Let me put it another way. Stone Boy also has not been spotted since the New Earth continuity existed. I think that tells you just how ridiculous his abilities are. So ridiculous that we can't even seem to find a place for him in the massive universe that is the Prime Earth continuity. And this is even after he finally manages to gain some ability in a possible future to move somewhat while in his stone form, post zero hour that is. Number three. 3D Man. When the Skrulls abducted test pilot Chuck Chandler, the human proved more wily to deal with than they anticipated. He tried to escape on his rocket plane, but accidentally caused an explosion that destroyed both the Skrull ship and Chuck. Bizarrely, Chuck's brother Hal witnessed the explosion, which caused Chuck to become a two-dimensional being living in Hal's glasses, imprinting an image of Chuck in each lens. If you think that doesn't make much sense, just you wait. When Hal wears the glasses and concentrates really hard, he can merge the two images of his brother, causing Chuck to emerge as the 3D Man. When freed from the glasses, 3D Man has three times his normal physical abilities because, you know, 3D. As an extra bonus, Hal falls into a coma every time 3D Man comes out of his glasses, only waking back up when his brother returns to the glasses. This is a confusing and convoluted gimmick that doesn't really seem worth it if all it does is free a hero who's not particularly useful. Also, the name 3D Man must be confusing for characters who don't know every detail about his life. I mean, most things are in 3D, right? Number two, Arm Falloff Boy. Arm Falloff Boy has to be one of the weirdest ones out there. Unlike another odd hero, Bouncing Boy, who eventually in the Prime Earth continuity achieved his dream, Arm Falloff Boy has never made the cut for the Legion of Superheroes. And that's saying something, considering that the Legion of Superheroes themselves are kind of a weird superhero team by all definitions. Arm Falloff Boy has the power to detach his limbs, which he typically then attempts to use to beat his enemies with. I mean, it's pretty cool that he can remove his limbs and survive, but it's less cool that really all he does from there is use his arm or his leg as a weapon. Especially as this means he now has less limbs to like move himself with in combat, so that's really pretty silly. And so is the automatopoeia that is often used to describe the sound of his power. Plorp. What a great automatopoeia. Number one, 
Fluff. First appearing in excellent number three, Fluff probably takes the cake for having the most confusing, disgusting, and odd power I've seen in a long time. Fluff is able to generate bucket loads of belly button lint at will and vary its chemical composition. Now first off, Ew. Secondly, belly button lint is just stray clothing fibers that come off of your clothes and collect in your belly button. Trust me, I know. Fluff wears a costume with a very deep V, which allows his navel to feel those sweet summer breezes, which means that he wouldn't have any belly button lint, which begs the question, what exactly is he shooting out of his little tum tum? You're free to speculate in the comments, but I refuse to give this character one more second of thought. Number 10, The Phantom Stranger. The Phantom Stranger comes from the DC Universe and is a character that is, well, very mysterious. I mean, his true origins have never been technically revealed. He has a lot of powers and is said to be one of the most powerful characters in the DC Universe. His powers include immortality, spell casting, illusion casting, reality manipulation, teleportation, dimensional travel, mental awareness, transmutation, and spectral sight. It's a lot. No one knows where he has gotten all these powers though. Well, not officially, that is. He has had a few different origins over the years. One was that he was a fallen angel who decided to stay neutral during Lucifer's rebellion against heaven. Another theory is that he is a remnant of a dead universe. Another is that he was a man named Isaac who had a wife and daughter around the time, you know, when Jesus would have been a child. When the king sent out soldiers to kill all the young male kids in an attempt to kill Jesus. Unfortunately, some of the casualties were his wife and son. He then blamed Jesus for this. He tried to take revenge on him, and because of this, Jesus sent him to walk the earth until doomsday. And another one was that he was alive during biblical times, and that one day he tried to commit suicide, but angels did not allow it. They stopped him from entering the afterlife and forced him to walk the earth for eternity, which showed him what he was meant to do, turn away humanity from evil. So, Phantom Stranger is a bit confusing, but that doesn't make him any less cool. Number nine, Legion. David is a very powerful mutant. He's the son of Charles Xavier, AKA Professor X. Now, it would be kind of impossible to list all of his powers because, well, he has so many, with more being added all the time. How is this possible? Well, let me explain. You see, David is an Omega level mutant with dissociative identity disorder, which means he has multiple personalities. Each of these personalities have their own abilities. So, one has telekinesis, while another has super strength, while another can shoot acid gas, while another can teleport, another can warp reality, and the list goes on and on. At one point, Rogue said while she was trapped inside of Legion that, that she saw thousands of personalities, all with unique powers, and more being created every single day. It's kind of crazy and almost makes him an unstoppable character. Although being able to control and tap into those abilities is another thing entirely. Number eight, Hope Summers. Hope Summers is the daughter of Nathan Summers, AKA Cable. She was born during a time when, well, mutants weren't supposed to be born. Which is why a lot of people call her the mutant messiah. Now, Hope has the power of the Phoenix Force. Now, Hope has had the power of the Phoenix Force at one point, but that is not what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about what her powers are on her own. You see, she has the power of superpower manipulation. Basically, she can control any power of a mutant that's around her. Now, when Hope was born, Cerebro detected her and then blew up, like she straight up destroyed it. Why? Well, I mean, that was never 100% clear, but people say it's because how powerful she was. Regardless, it happened and it was a really big deal. After that, she couldn't be detected by any mutant detecting equipment. So now that leaves a lot of fans asking if she is even a mutant at all, which makes things even more complicated. Number seven, Longneck. Longneck, also known as William Hanover, is a mutant who made his first and only appearance during New X-Men issue 140. He was one of the mutants that ended up losing his powers during M-Day. His powers are very weird and don't really make a lot of sense. He has a long neck. That's literally it. Why is that his power? And what purpose does it really serve is anyone's guess. The character hasn't shown up again since, so at this point, all we can do is theorize about it. What do you guys think Lungnik can do with his powers? Put those theories down below. We need to figure this out. Number six, Choir. Irana Clayton is a mutant, also known as Choir. She first appeared in New X-Men issue 119. Her power is that she has three extra mouths all over her neck, 
And these notes can make her sound different or even make her sound like she's talking in a completely different location. I mean, that could be useful in certain scenarios, but not really overall. She ended up losing her powers later on because of what a Scarlet Witch did in M-Day, so she really doesn't have to worry about, you know, using them anymore. But still, that doesn't really stop us from wondering what the point of that power really was. Number five, the Hulk. Everyone knows Hulk's ability to turn into a big old green monster and rip things apart with a strength that increases based on his anger. But what many of you may not know is that Hulk actually possesses a much more subtle ability to see astral projections and ghosts and even interact with them if he chooses. Hulk's astral form perception has come in handy when working with Doctor Strange as a defender. But why does Hulk have this ability? Well, Bruce Banner subconsciously feared his father's ghost would come back to haunt him, like literally come back to haunt him. And so the Hulk just developed this mechanism to allow him to look out for that ghost, and I guess other ghosts as well. There isn't really more to it. Hulk just developed the ability that is something usually reserved for telepaths. For the super intelligent Bruce Banner, it would make a bit more sense, but it's been suggested that for Bruce, the clarity of the astral forms is diminished when compared to the telepathically resistant Hulk's ability to view them. With the mortal Hulk and the connection to the one below all, perhaps that could serve as some kind of fan explanation but we don't have a real one, so... Uh. Number 4, Jin Genie. Jin Genie was a mutant, but unlike almost any other mutant ever, her powers were directly dependent on how much alcohol she consumed. Becca Parker had the power to generate seismic vibrations proportionate to her amount of alcoholic intake. As you can imagine, being intoxicated in order to use your superpowers can be rather Mm, interesting. It seems like one of those things you should add to the list of things you shouldn't do while under the influence. Like, don't drive, don't operate heavy machinery, don't use your superpowers to cause seismic vibrations. That kind of thing. Unfortunately, we do not get to see her use her powers that much or get an explanation for why alcohol fuels said powers because Jin Genie is de-lifed in the same comic that she was introduced in. X-Force number 116 in July 2001. Number three, Superman. Back in the day, while Superman was a fairly new being, he would kind of have whatever superpower he wanted slash needed at the time until eventually his set table of powers was established. But there is one new power that appeared in 1958, Superman number 125, where Superman learned to fire a tiny version of himself out of his hands. After discovering a tiny spaceship that blows up in his face, Superman loses all of his abilities minus, interestingly, his invulnerability. Luckily, he gained the ability to literally fire a doll-sized version of himself out of his hand that had all of his powers and would go and beat up criminals or melt icebergs. What's hilarious is that Superman even got jealous of the little mini him. When a guided missile was on its way to the Eiffel Tower, he sent out his little buddy and an onlooker shouted, how cute, to which he said, Cute? What nonsense! Fortunately for Superman, his mini-me was destroyed by a kryptonite meteorite and Superman's powers were restored to him. Number 2, Color Kid. Ulu Vak from the planet Lupra is the hero known as Color Kid, and his name does indeed suit his abilities. Vak was struck by a multicolored beam of light from another dimension that granted him the incredible power to alter the color of objects and people. And that is literally all he can do. It's stated that this power is probably caused by him changing the spectrum of light around the person or thing, but there are no real explanations given. It also does absolutely nothing for him or anyone else. Color Kid decided to use this power to go and audition to be a member of the Legion of Superheroes and, what do you know, he was rejected from the team and his powers were deemed useless. While it may be true, it feels a little bit mean, but at least he got in with the Legion of Substitute Heroes, so there's that. And in at number one is El Guapo. Robbie Rodriguez who goes by El Guapo is a mutant from the Marvel Universe. But that kind of opens up a whole bunch of questions because Robbie doesn't seem to have any powers of his own. Unless you consider his symbiotic relationship with his flying skateboard a superpower. His wiki page refers to this as an idiosyncratic manipulation, suggesting that Robbie actually has total control over his skateboard. But the problem with that statement is that his skateboard also acted with a mind of its own, like when it beat him up for cheating on his girlfriend. Now, an argument could be made that perhaps it's his own subconsciousness beating himself up for doing the wrong thing, but that's just a me theory and Marvel did not state this to be true or even explain his ability at all really. 
It's not telekinesis, and the board seems to have a mind of its own. I don't know. You tell me what you think. Number 10, Tattooed Man. Mark Richards was a former Marine who was presumed dead before showing up in Gotham as a killer for hire with the ability to make his tattoos come to life as projections, which then attack his enemies. He explains his powers as being due to a magic process called sin grafting, which takes the sins of his victims and makes them into tattoo monsters. Now, that's comic booky and fun, but that's also incredibly vague. Why are sins turning into tattoos? Which sins are worth a tattoo monster? I don't know, it's just weird to me that none of the heroes or villains he comes across ever seem to ask any follow-up questions. Number nine, the Fisherman. Fisherman is an Aquaman villain who often works as a smuggler, running weapons to Atlantean rebels and using trained dolphins to run into France. He uses a large fishing pole with super strong fishing line to attack and tie up his enemies, as well as a series of specialized lures that blow up or shoot gases at his enemies. Dumb, but pretty straightforward. What makes him so confusing is that it has since been revealed that his helmet is actually a sentient parasite that takes over their host's mind and makes them commit fishing-related crimes. Kind of like if Venom was a retired dad. What I don't get about this is why would a parasite give its host the ability to be good at fishing? Was the parasite formed in a Bass Pro Shop? Backstory and the theme of this villain just do not match. In case you're thinking, maybe it was the host's idea to go with the hobbyist theme. Each time the parasite has bonded with a new host, that person has also taken on the identity of the fisherman. So it is the parasite's choice to continue with the fisherman theme. Number eight, Swarm. Fritz von Meyer was a Nazi scientist who came across an irradiated beehive and began experimenting on the bees, hoping that he would be able to control them to do his bidding. The experiment went wrong and the bees turned on him, devouring Fritz. As he was eaten by the bees, his consciousness was spread between all the bees in the hive. So he was granted control of the bees, but at a weird, twisty cost. He uses this ability to control bees, to form them into a body-like shape, and tries to cleanse the earth of all humans. He can also form other shapes out of bees and use them to attack people. I don't get it. I mean, radioactive or not, why would getting eaten by bees, who only eat pollen, by the way, cause you to become a hive mind? Look. He's a very visually interesting villain, but he raises a lot more questions than he answers. Number seven, Mr. Mixia Spitlick. Mr. Mixia Spitlick is a fifth dimensional being who has developed an obsession with Superman, and he likes to spend his time harassing the Man of Steel and putting him through various ordeals for his own amusement. He can fly, teleport, and create essentially anything he likes just with a thought. He's also a character with cosmic awareness, sometimes speaking directly to the reader as though he's aware of his place in a comic book. A lot of his powers are explained by saying that he can manipulate reality. However, what's weird is his weakness is that if someone tricks him into saying his name backwards, he's forced to return to the fifth dimension for 90 days and undo any damage that he caused. Look, if he can do what he wants, why does that work? This is a creature that can bend reality to his will, yet he's repeatedly brought down by saying a word. Is this self-imposed? Is he just trying to be a good sport? Neither would surprise me, but the only thing I know for sure about Mr. Mitchell Spitlick is that nothing he does really makes sense. That's kind of the point. Number six, Polka Dot Man. Although he doesn't technically have superpowers, this villain's gimmick is too confusing not to get into. Polka Dot Man commits crimes by tearing off the various colored dots on his costume, throwing them, and then letting them expand and morph into the various gadgets that he needs. For example, he can tear a dot off, transform it into a buzzsaw blade, and throw it at Batman and Robin as he escapes on a flying saucer, as he does in his first appearance in Detective Comics number 300. Well, I can suspend my belief when I see Batman pull whatever he needs out of his utility belt. The idea of Polka Dot Man being able to carry around full vehicles on his costume is just too much. What makes it even more confusing is we've never received any explanation for how this works. His origin and powers were altered and frankly improved in the live action adaptation of The Suicide Squad, where it was revealed that his mother had been a scientist at Star Labs who had exposed him to an alien virus in an attempt to give him superpowers. This resulted in him being able to cast glowing 
colored dots that destroyed whatever they came into contact with. Number five, Arm Fall Off Boy. He made his first appearance in Secret Origins Volume 2, Issue 46. His real name isn't even known, so now we have to call him Arm Fallout Boy. I mean, Fall Off Boy. His powers are just that. He can take his arms off and use them as weapons. Now, he tried to enlist as a member of the Legion of Superheroes, but was rejected. He was actually the first reject. Matter Eater Lad said that he got these oddly specific powers because he was careless when holding the anti-gravity metal element 152, but it's hard to tell if he was serious. His arms aren't robotic arms, like Bucky Barnes for example. His arm can actually come off and then you can use it as a metal weapon. Sure, that's great, but it doesn't make a plorp sound, you know? So he takes his own arm off, hits people with his wet shoulder blade, and then just plorps it back on. Wouldn't it be damaged? Also, would he feel the pain as soon as he connected it back to his body and his brain? All the questions. Also, ew. Number four, Songbird. Melissa Gold made her comic book debut in The Incredible Hulk issue 449. She ran away from her parents at a young age and whilst developing a hard knock life attitude, she ended up becoming a professional wrestler, giving herself the stage name Screaming Mimi, and then soon joined the wrestling group Grapplers. So the Grapplers were doing great, they were killing it, but they weren't making the same amount of money as the male wrestlers. So they had to take on a new job now, with the Roxxon Oil Company. Now because of Quasar, the mission went horribly and the Grapplers were tried and jailed. Melissa was given vocal cord implants that provided her with acoustic kinesis hence her first nickname, Screaming Mimi. She can make all these crazy weapons with her voice as well, and even has the ability to craft herself wings with her voice and fly somehow. She joined the Masters of Evil in Avengers issue 271, but when she could no longer use her powers, Zemo came in with his accomplice, the Fixer, and gave her new powers with neck implants. Her sound energy is pretty cool, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, she can create solid weapons and force fields, and she can even go as far as to make herself undetectable by others. Fascinating, yes. Confusing. Also, yes. Number three, Bouncing Boy. He made a spectacular arrival to Action Comics in issue 276. He's a member of that legion of superheroes that I keep mentioning. So yes, this guy made it through, and the dude who used his arm as a Nerf bat was rejected. What a world, okay. So Chuck Tain was born on Earth and he has this unique ability where he can inflate like a beach ball and bounce around. The combination of invulnerability and velocity makes him quite the unit. He got these powers by accidentally drinking a super plastic formula that he thought was soda pop. Does he have to be round? Does he have to bounce around? I feel like his powers are not really specific here. If he's strong and unstoppable, can he just inflate himself a little bit and then fight like a normal person? Like can he make his fist into extreme sock and boppers and then boing like they'll bounce away and then boing and they'll bounce away. It was a little bit better than being a beach ball than bouncing around like that chick from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That sounds like a nightmare. You get a lot more done than being the beach ball of doom, is all I'm saying. Number two, Jin Genie. Becca Parker was one of the X-Force members. She was introduced in issue 116. Her powers don't make a lot of sense, but they're so fun and specific that I have to talk about her. So the more alcohol in her system she has, the more powerful she becomes. She probably kills it at holiday office parties, eh? Wow, she's the first one going home at like 9 p.m. You're like, really? Oh, Jin Genie, that makes sense. Jin Genie has the power to generate seismic vibrations, depending on how much she drinks. Now, it's not specified how this works. Are we talking about the amount you drink or the percentages? Because this one, we could maybe find a solution in time. Finally, number one, Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. So as crazy as his name sounds, that's just it. He made his first debut in DC Comics with Doom Patrol issue 89. Swedish scientist Sven Larsson gained these incredible powers after falling into a vat of mysterious amino acids. So now he can change any part of his body into any animal, any vegetable, or any mineral. And he can do them at the same time. It doesn't have to be one of them. It can be all of them at the same time and on different body parts. How insane and overpowered is that? Spotlight is on Steve Larson, also known as Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. He was attacked by his secondary dinosaur head during a robbery gone wrong. So not only does this not make any sense at all, but this is insane. This guy should never lose a fight. The possibilities are literally endless. The fact that he can somehow control all three at the same time as well, like your mind must be amazing.